So Peter has to leave uh, on time, so we have to start on time. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Neil Stewart. Professor Stewart has, pu has published in a great many top journals in different areas, including numerous publications, pa numerous papers in management science, nature, human behavior, journal of marketing, American Economic Review, Psych Review, Psych Science, Jeb General, and much, much more. Also, I suggest you to be nice to Professor Stewart as he now serves as the Pro Dean at the Warwick Business School. Now we will proceed as follows. Uh, Nell will have about 45 to 50 minutes for his presentation, and then about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And then the formal part will be over and Peter will be able to go. And then those who have time to stay can stay for additional 15 to 20 minutes of discussion. And now, Neil, the floor, the floor is all yours. Well, yeah, th thank you so much for your invitation. It's really lovely to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure the pro dean thing comes with much power. It mostly comes with being nice to people. That's my main my main management tool at the moment. Um, this is a piece of work which we've called attention utility. And I don't know if Adica is out there, actually, because I can't see all of the all of the participants yet, but um, this is work with Adica, Chris Torreblanca, John Gathergood, and George Lowenstein, um, which we are uh, sort of it's on on tour at the moment. So all comments and questions are very welcome. I don't know if it's a grotesque violation of etiquette, the FM, but I'm happy to take questions from people as we go along, especially if it's points of clarification. Cool. Right, where are we? Okay. Um, gone off the screen a wee hasn't it? How's that? By the way, the tough guy here is Peter and Ori. I'm not the tough guy. You can break the rules of this for me. I think we maybe, maybe, hopefully, hopefully we will survive, hopefully. Um, so I guess there's already a literature on information avoidance. And so this is, and I've got some references on the slide here, but this is the case when people avoid information, even when it would be beneficial for them to know the information that they know the they can get the information that it's available and that it's free to access or even that it's costly to avoid and that you have to go out of your way to avoid the information even though it might be useful to you so there's lots of examples of this so um, patients avoid getting or viewing the results of medical tests when they fear bad news um Investors who avoid looking at their financial portfolios when the stock market declines. And in particular, our work's quite closely related to this work by um, Sickerman and Lowenstein and colleagues uh, who demonstrated that um, when the market index um, changes, people are, well, if the market index has gone up, people are more likely to log in and look at their portfolios. But if the market index has gone down, people are less likely to log in and look at their portfolios. And the idea there is that when you, the market index, oh, Edeka is here. I've just seen Edeka appear. Hi, Edeka. Um, when, when you, the market index has moved, you think, oh, I wonder what that means for my portfolio. And many people don't hold very many stocks. And so, uh, the returns on their own portfolio will only be really weakly correlated with the market index. But nonetheless, I think if the market index has gone up, I want to log in and have a look because that's probably good news for me. And when I log in and have a look, I can learn exactly how much good news it is for me. And similarly, if it's the market index has gone down, I avoid logging in because I don't want to learn the new information about this bad news for me. We also see it in people sort of every day um, uh, checking or um, current accounts where people avoid checking their accounts when they're indebted um, and indeed in having a look informally at some data in a big retail bank we can see people become uh, as, as their balance drops people look at their account more and more and more but once the balance crosses zero people stop looking at their accounts uh, apart from a subset of people who carry on looking, and they're the people who cure themselves very quickly by transferring some money in from somewhere else to bring their balance back above zero. 
but it seems that a subset of people, once their balance has gone below zero, they simply stop looking because they don't, perhaps they don't want to see the bad news. Um, and then in the management literature, there's work on managers who avoid hearing arguments that conflict with decisions that they've kind of already taken. Um, and so what, what's common across all of this literature is that people have a tendency to want to avoid information, uh, even when it might be useful to them, um, if that information is bad. So this is a standard approach in the literature to dealing with these sorts of phenomena called belief-based utility. Um, and it's the idea that people derive utility not only from objective reality, but also from their beliefs about that reality. Um, and to sort of get to the uh, avoidance situation here, the idea is that people are risk averse over their beliefs and the same as they can be risk averse over other um, outcomes. And so they might avoid acquiring new information um, because the expected utility of um, learning the bad news exceeds the expected utility of getting the good news. In other words, I might have some beliefs that things are well in the world and I deliberately avoid acquiring information otherwise because those beliefs about things being good themselves have utility and I don't want to lose them. Um, and so when I go and seek new information, I'm taking a risk that I might lose those, uh, I might lose those um, positive beliefs. So th th this is the idea that people may be motivated to form optimistic beliefs and, and thus they become reluctant to having the, you know, the optimism bubble burst um, by receiving realistic information, which they can't ignore. Okay. So what we're introducing here, or primarily, I guess, we're introducing the, you know, uh, the sort of uh, evidence base to support this idea of attention utility is, I think, reasonably, among psychologists at least, a pretty non-controversial idea that... Um, Attention utility, we're going to say, is about the hedonic pleasure, or perhaps displeasure, derived purely from looking at or thinking about uh, known information. Um, so, and by that, when we say looking at or thinking about, in other words, paying attention to. And what distinguishes attention utility from the belief-based utility and for most of the sort of the previous work on information avoidance is that in those settings, the information isn't already known to the uh, individual. And that when they pay attention to something, they gain new information and that information in itself may have utility or disutility. The idea here with attention utility is that people just pay attention to stuff that they already know about and that the stream of utility that comes to them is sort of conferred just from paying attention to or savoring this information. Um, I guess it's the equivalent of, I've got a photograph of a kid, you can't see it, it's just here, right? There's, I've got a photograph of my children who I happen to quite like. Uh, I already know what that photograph looks like completely because it's right here on my desk, I see it all the time. And yeah, I still quite enjoy looking at it. Um, even though I'm getting no new information from it at all, but I'm just, you know, enjoying the fact that there's a picture of a couple of people that I love. So that's kind of the idea that we're thinking about with attention utility. So the story I'm going to tell you for the first part of the talk is about um, retail investors in the UK from uh, one of the largest stockbroking platforms so they can go online and they can buy and sell stocks and shares and they can look at they can log in and look at their portfolios whenever they want and so we're going to focus on the login activity in the days immediately after that people have made a purchase of a stock and what i'm going to tell you is that investors are more likely to pay attention to their accounts in other words log in when the stock that they just purchased has made gains. And we're gonna be able to control for movements in the market index. And the claim that we're gonna make is 
that the pattern that we see of people logging in more after a stock they've recently bought has gone up in value, um, that can only arise if investor login choices are determined, at least in part, by information that they already know about the performance of their individual stocks. And the idea is that with this sort of analysis, we can detect the excess logins arriving, arising purely from the desire to look at portfolios as distinct from the desire to, say, see a movement in the market index and learn what that means for your own portfolio. So in other words, we're saying that people, they basically log into their portfolios to look at a pile of money and feel happy about it, or a pile of stocks and shares, when, when, that's, when those stocks and shares are doing well. Um, and they're not learning anything new. They just enjoy savoring, uh, seeing that things are going well, which they already know. Um, whereas the previous work from Sikkiman et al. showed that when the market index went up, you thought, oh, that's probably good news for me. Uh, so you log in and have a look, and then you can find out exactly how good news it is for you. So the market index is an average of, I don't know, maybe in that, I think it was S&P 500 in that case. So it's 500 stocks and, and shares, um, of which the individuals only hold a few. But if the average has gone up, and you know, then your portfolio has probably gone up too. And you log in to learn that. But here, we're suggesting people don't learn any new information. So that's what I'm going to tell you for the first bit of this uh, talk. And then um, in a minute, we'll we'll jump and we'll think about uh, some experiments that we've run um, to kind of uh, triangulate in on this effect from a different direction. Neil, could it yeah. be that sometimes people just, you know, they, they log in just to, because they think it's maybe it's too good to be true. So they don't believe it. They want like proof, additional proof for things to happen. It could be that they have sort of ir irrational worries that something really good has happened to them and it'll be snatched away from them if they don't keep vigilant. This is perhaps, uh, yeah, that could be true. Um, it could also be, I, I mean, I guess it could be that they log in because uh, something good has happened, but they've forgotten exactly how good. So they log in to learn how good. That could maybe be true as well. Um, so it's really hard to rule out the possibility that um, people aren't relearning something that they already have seen, but have somehow forgotten, I guess. Um, that could be true. I, I guess you have we have to pause and think how plausible it is. I guess the effects I'm going to show you are quite large, and they're also a bit categorical, which makes me think that uh, it's sort of that, that learning exactly how good or monitoring monitoring to check it's still there is probably not so critical. Um, I shall I shall ponder that whilst I'm talking and, and come back if I've got more to say on that. Thanks. Uh, I guess in general it will be hard to distinguish attention from all kind of other uh, explanations, and that will be a big part of your work, I assume. Uh, yes. Yeah, it is. It, it is. I think it is quite difficult, and so we're we're presenting this as a piece of a you know a, a piece of evidence that there's this attention utility idea, which I don't think is a particularly controversial idea that people like looking at nice stuff, um, even though they're not really learning any new information. Um, but nonetheless, the 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 threshold for demonstrating that that's all there is is quite high. I agree. I'll have a go, and then we'll, we'll come back to it. And, and see what you think. So what's this? So we've got about 97,000 accounts um, from the stockbroking platform. Uh, and I'll just talk you through a wee bit of these sort of summary statistics, just to give you a feel of what sort of people and what sort of thing they're doing. So uh, what female 0.19. So that means about 80% of people on the platform are male. Uh, they're older, so 54 years. Um, they have typically had the account for about five years or thereabouts. So that's what we know about the people. Um, in terms of the portfolios, it's quite a skewed distribution of, of the value of the portfolios, but the mean is 64,000. 
65,000 pounds. The median is only 16, so it's obviously quite a positively skewed distribution. The, the platform is, I mean, maybe this is a, data from about, well, Edica, you'll remember better than me, but about 2014 or thereabouts over a few years. On this platform, people didn't have very much money invested in mutual funds. So the idea that you'd put all of your money into some index fund uh, wasn't very popular, at least among, among these investors. What they tend to do instead is hold individual and possibly quite famous stocks. Um, on average, they've got uh, five stocks in their portfolio, uh, but again, a bit of variation in the number of stocks. In terms of what they do, they're logging in on about 20% of days. I guess that would count as about logging in about once a week um, to have a look at their portfolios. Again, there's quite a lot of variability in that. And they're trading on about uh, 2%, 2 to 3% of days, which means they log in about 10 times more often than they trade, which is already a bit of a clue, isn't it? So most of the time, I mean, they could be logging in with the possibility of trading every single time they log in and just not trading 90% of the time. But perhaps plausible is that they log in quite often, perhaps without any intention of trading. And maybe those logins are to learn new information about how things are going, um, or maybe those logins are just to, as I'm suggesting here, sometimes savor the money that's in the account. So that's the kind of sample we've got. Let me show you, where are we? Yeah, let me show you this plot here. So I'll just go through it bit by bit. Um, you, you can't see this. You guys are covering up all the axes labels. There we are. Um, on the x-axis, we've got the return since the previous day. And we've done the analysis with the return since the... So you, you buy a stock yesterday, and maybe it goes up by, I don't know, 1% or 2% today. So that's the sort of change in the stock price from the close of yesterday to the close of today. We've looked at that because those figures are, are readily available and, and they're there for everybody. And they're often the figures that are reported in the media. So that's what's on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we've got the probability that a person logs in and uh, looks at information about their account. Um, the restriction here is that we're looking at days where on day zero, you bought something. And then we're looking at logins in the five days following that. And we're only looking at those five day periods where no other trading, you don't buy buy anything else in those five days. So that the trade that you made on day zero, uh, that is always the most recent trade in that period. Now each dot in the plot represents 1% of all of the account days in the data of which there are many, many, many thousands. Um, so this dot here, for example, represents the 1% of account days where um, the uh, where the return since the previous day is the worst, in, in the worst 1%. And so on average, those have dropped just over 8% on the day. And on those days, the days following, people have got, what's that, about 43% chance of logging in. So each dot here is representing 1% of all of the data. And so each dot's got thousands and thousands of observations in it um, to come to an average. Uh, the gray lines we've drawn on are lines of best fit for returns below zero and returns above zero. And the break point here, that's the jump, I guess, in the probability that people log in as their returns go from below zero, in other words, they've lost money, to above zero, which means they've gained money since they bought the stock. Sorry, since the previous day. So the idea here that you can just sort of see in the reasonably raw data is that there's a jump here of about, well, it's typically about four or five percent. So against a baseline of about sort of 40 percent chance of um, logging in, it's about a 10 percent change. So it's a reasonable effect size. Um, 
that happens when the return since the previous day is positive, people are more likely to log in and look at their portfolio than if the return since the previous day is negative. Okay. Um, let me show you a, a sort of a regression table that, that talks that through. And I'll talk you through that, sorry. Uh, and then I've got sort of a few caveats and things to say that I think we might be able to cover off some of the comments from earlier on. Uh, do you know, I might even have advised my students against just dumping a whole regression table into a presentation, but uh, I'm questioning the wisdom of that now. Let's look at column one, first of all, because that's the simplest regression. So in there, um, the dependent variable is whether you log in or not, and it's just a dummy zero one. Uh, and the independent variable is just a dummy that says whether since uh, the most recent stock has gone up in value or not. Um, so we've got a constant uh, at, if it hasn't gone up in value, the probability of logging in is about 44%. If it's gone up in value, it's 4% higher. Um, so that's what we take away from that. Um, got something else nagging away in my mind. So that's like the, the sort of the dumbest regression you could possibly do. And then as we go left to right, the models change a bit and get more complicated. But the thing to notice is that uh, the coefficient on this dummy variable for whether the, the most recent stock's return is positive or not, that's always a positive value and quite well defined. Um, it's an OLS model, which is perhaps not exactly the right thing to do on um, probabilities, uh, but we've got robustness checks where we do uh, something like a something more appropriate, like a logistic regression. These are at least easy to interpret. Um, so in the second column, we've added in, if you like, the slopes of these lines above and below. So rather than just having a single, we basically fitted a step with a 4% jump before. Column two here has those lines and that that two there is a better estimate of what this gap is just here. Um, and so that's a 2% increase on a baseline of about 45% uh, logging in. Sorry, start that again. When the stock is in loss, just below zero, you've got a 45% chance of logging in. That's 2% higher when you're just the other side of zero, the tiniest amount, and you've got uh, uh, an ever so slightly positive return. We can do the same thing where we add in lots of customer controls and account controls. Um, it, the results are very stable. Uh, we've got another version where we've added in the FTSE 100 uh, performance. So this stockbroker is based in the UK. The FTSE 100 is the index of the top 100 UK-based shares, which is what most people spend their money on in this data set. Um, so what that means is that this coefficient survives and stays positive. What it means is that it's not just that people log in because the market's gone up and people are curious to see what that means for their own portfolio. So they log in to learn some new information. So if you like, the fact that this co coefficient here is positive uh, is, a, is the same finding that Sikkerman et al. had that when the market index goes up, people log in and have a look at their portfolios. But I guess we've controlled for that here, and yet the return on their most recent stock is still a, a positive and, and well-defined coefficient, which means that over and above the um, market index information, people are logging in to look at their portfolio. And I'm going to argue it must be the case that they already know that how well a recent stock has done, because if they didn't know that, this coefficient up here um, I'm hoping you can see the mouse. Yeah, you can see the mouse. This coefficient up here would be zero, right? Whereas this coefficient would be positive. So that this coefficient remains positive and not very much diminished in magnitude is telling me that actually people are logging in conditional on how their most recent stock has done, which means they must know how their most recent stock has done before they decide whether to log in or not. Otherwise, that, that coefficient wouldn't be significant and positive. Um, Can I ask a quick uh, 
clarifying question? Yes. So how okay. how would they how would they know? Because it's like a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Because if they're getting price data from another source, mm -hmm. then they would know to log in. But if they're logging in to get the price data, they wouldn't know that the stock was up until after they logged in. Yeah, if they're logging in to get the price data, I mean, they could that, that could well be happening. It could even be happening quite a lot. But that wouldn't bias this coefficient in one direction or the other. This coefficient is just telling you about the people who already know um, adjusting their behavior in terms of logging in. Does that so make sense? So they're getting the price data from some external yeah. source. And so and one day stock returns are sort of quite widely av available if you read the pages of the Financial Times, they often report these or they'll report them in the news or if you have any kind of tracker on your phone, you know, an app with just returns on it and so on. Um, they must be getting the information from those places. Oh, and, and these investors are probably buying pretty popular stocks. So it's like if they log yeah. on to some financial news channel, it'll say, you know, Apple or whatever is up and exactly. then they'll go check. Okay, exactly. all right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, you're Thank very you very much. Um, what have we got here? Controls for uh, how yeah. the rest of the portfolio has changed so that we can see it's really a most recent stock effect. Neil, can um, I? Yeah, no, far away. Who's that? Sorry. Ori, yeah. Oh, um, hi, Ori. Uh, so the most direct uh, uh, test for this would be if someone logged in twice the same day, do you have that data? Uh, it's almost like you have seen a few slides ahead in the slide deck, so I shall come to that in a moment. Yeah, that's a, that's a, 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 a prescient suggestion. Yeah, I shall come to that in a moment, if that's OK. Uh, the very last column, we've got account fixed effects, which soaks up a lot of variability in terms of individual differences in how people like to uh, pay attention to their accounts, which I said was quite variable earlier on. So what it means is that this coefficient here, which is, I mean, it's a bit diminished, but there's, it, it's still a 1% increase on a baseline of about 40%. Um, that must be identified off within person changes in stock returns, affecting one person's choice of whether to log in or not in a, on a given day. Um, so it gets rid of sort of all that that's identified off within person variability. So that means it gets rid of a lot of explanations about between person differences, I guess as candidate explanations. OK, so that's kind of like the, I guess we've put that as our headline finding, because that's the one that lets us use all of the data and come up with really nice estimates, right? But we did uh, lots of robustness tests of which uh, makes a, a, it's the fashion in economics papers to have 160 page manuscripts with you know a 100 page uh, appendix in there so we've got quite a lot of uh, different tests which I've just summarized here so things we've done as robustness tests are try out different functional forms for the performance of the FTSE 100 because it, it could be that people's logging in is conditional on some complicated function of the FTSE 100 and are simply including it as a you know a linear um, uh, independent variable isn't complicated enough. So we did that. We tried out the time horizon instead of just a five day window. So you buy a stock and then we look in the following five days to see whether you log in or not. We've taken it out to 20 days um, and still see the effect. We can see that the effect is larger for top ups when you only have one stock in your portfolio. But it's also the effect is still there about half the size in multi-stock portfolios. I guess that kind of makes sense because if you've only got one stock, that's only one thing to attend to in the world. If you've got many stocks, maybe the, you know, the effect is slightly diluted across those many stocks. And the effect also holds if you use return since purchase instead of the one day returns. Now return since purchase aren't necessarily publicly available. Uh, at least not without a little bit of effort on your part. I mean, the returns are all publicly available, but you'd have to do the calculation yourself because you know when you bought the stock and the newspaper doesn't. 
Um, whereas one day returns is just a return since yesterday, and that's common, common for everybody. But the results hold when using return since purchase instead. We've also got a couple of other tests. So this goes to your point. Was that from was it from I can't remember who it was from though? Was it from Ori? About logging in. So this is a case at the weekend or on bank holidays and so on, the market is closed, which means if I log in and look on a Saturday when the market's closed, I can learn all of the information about my portfolio. Logging in on a Sunday, the market's closed, so nothing will have moved. I will see exactly the same information. And so what we've got here in this first column, this coefficient here, and the, the regression tables are quite big. This one does goes off the bottom of the screen. My apologies. But this is showing that that 1% increase in the probability of logging in holds if, even if you're logging in repeatedly on days when the market's closed. So it's the probability of a second login given you've already logged in once during the period when the market's closed. Um, and then this coefficient is if the most recent stock was up. So if the most recent stock's up on a Friday and you log in on a Saturday, this is the change to the probability that you log in on a Sunday because the stock was up on a Friday. Does that make sense? Did I get that right? Just start that one again. So the stock either makes a gain or a loss on the Friday. You've logged in and looked at it on the Saturday. And now we're looking at the effect of that gain on the Friday and whether you choose to log in and look on the Sunday. When you won't get any new information, you know exactly what you're going to see because you just saw it the day before. So I think that comes quite close to this idea of being reasonably sure that nothing has moved underneath the person. They know that they're going to log in and see the same thing that they saw the day before. And yet they still are more likely to do it when things were good on the Friday. I'm sorry, can I ask another uh, yeah, yeah, go for question? It. Um, so the question that I have is, so with a lot of these online brokerage firms, when you log in, the first thing that shows up is the total account value. Mm -hmm. So let's say that they bought a stock five days ago and it's up 10%, but let's say that other companies in the portfolio are down. So when they log mm -hmm. in, the first screen that they see is, is negative. Mm-hmm. Like I, I would be curious if it's, you know, and I don't even so know off how the you top would... of my head, trying to remember the screenshots yeah. of the platform. When you log in, you, I think you, you see a, a one row per stock that you hold display. And then the okay. things are either red or green or red or black as to whether they're up or down on the previous day. So it's visually quite salient. Whether the oh, so it's not down. like in the US where it's like you log in and it just shows the total account value as the first screen. No, and get. some of the platforms in the UK have that property as well. I don't know whether, Edeke, you're out there and you've got a microphone and you can chip I in agree. on that because I can't remember exactly whether there's also a headline result displayed. The other thing I, I would add, though, is that um, in these regressions, mm -hmm. if I go back a wee bit, we've got... Uh, uh, control for how the remaining stocks in the portfolio are doing and the effect survives oh, okay. having that in there. So, yeah, I don't doubt that that would be an important thing. Um, okay, so you it's are... It's just that the return you on your overall there. portfolio isn't going to be the publicly available information that you could know without logging in, if that makes sense. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank we're you. trying to separate ourselves from the, the Sikuman et al. study. And I think you know, the technicalities of that separation are quite small, but I think what it means in terms of what the utility is being gained from is quite important. Here we're claiming it's just from savoring information that you already know, whereas in Sikuman et al., the possibility is open, and indeed it was originally explained as the utility from gaining new information, even though you're not gaining any money, you're just gaining information. Thank you. Uh, you are very welcome. Um, right. So I've put this slide in here because um, I guess if you're an ec economist, if you're a diehard economist, you might not really care too much about whether people are looking at their portfolios or not. Because if you want to understand why the market might move, all that matters is whether people actually trade or not. It doesn't matter how people are watching it. It just matters if stocks are getting bought or sold. So we're going to switch dependent variable here and think about a dummy which indicates whether people made 
a subsequent trade in that five day period after. So they trade on, on, on day zero. And then do they make another trade in the five day period afterwards? Because that would be the consequential sort of economic behavior. And so in this regression here, and again, it's gone off the bottom of the screen, but it's the, it's the stuff you saw before. This 0 0.0030, that's against, uh, that's, that, that effect there is against quite a low probability that people trade. Um, and it's showing that people are more likely to trade if the stock they bought on day zero has gone up in value overnight. And then we can do the same thing with the controls for the slope of the line either side of zero. So you get, rather than fitting a step function, you're fitting sort of two lines with a break in them. So that's the size of the break. And then here, um, we've added in fixed effects, and your faces are covering up the fixed effects, for account, stock, and day. So we've covered off quite a lot of sources of variability uh, in having those fixed effects in. So this, just to give you an idea of the size of this coefficient, this means that there's about a 0.6% increase in the probability of a trade against a baseline of, a, of about 6%. So that means that the probability of a trade's gone up by about 10% if the stock you bought on day zero did well. So it's not just that the uh desire to basically look at your money and enjoy the good news again it's news you already know but you just want to read it again and be happy it's not just that that affects your login behavior but it's also affecting your subsequent trading behavior and then in the last four uh three columns of this what we've done is we've added in a control for um logging in or not um as, as a dummy and you can see that that coefficient is now greatly reduced in its size. And indeed, so we should be comparing the 0 0.0055 to the 0 0.0001. So that coefficient has gone to zero. Standard error is quite well, it's, it's still pretty small, um, not significant anymore. In other words, measuring whether you've logged in or not um, completely attenuates the uh, whether you go on and trade or not. In other words, the mechanism by which the day zero return, sorry, the overnight return on the stock you bought on day zero increases trading is in entirely through making you log in or not to the platform. Um, so yeah, just to wrap that up. So there is a consequential economic behavior, which is a change in trading. And that's entirely uh, mediated by um how the login sorry how the return on the day zero stock has changed your login behavior so your attention changes and that subsequently affects your and that affects your subsequent trading behavior so sort of an interim conclusion before i go on and tell you about a few experiments that we ran um i think we're trying to show that individuals devote excess attention to already known positive information and about the performance of individual stocks in their portfolio. And that means that when their most recent stock that they most recently purchased has declined in value, investors don't look because they don't want to relive that bad information. And so they don't trade either. So that's kind of where I'm at on the trading data. And then if for the, the last bit of time, I'm going to move on and just talk about some experiments, which I can go a wee bit quicker on, I think, because, um, well, you'll see that there's, a, there's an analogy here, right? So I'll tell you about three experiments. Here's the first one. Uh, 1,780 retail investors on Prolific. So in stage one, we ask these people, what's the largest stock that you've held hold now that you've held for at least six months and then they tell us that and then we send them a custom email telling them about the absolute performance and the performance relative to the FTSE of the stock that they just told us about and in that email we invite them to stage two of the survey and actually we don't really care we tell them that the stage two of the survey asks them more about their holding and it asks some more questions about them but actually the dependent variable that we care about is just whether they come and do stage two of the survey. Okay, so they tell us about their biggest stock, 
and then we tell them something about their stock and we say to them, here's how your stock's done in the past six months. Do you want to come and talk some more about it? And the unsurprising finding is going to be that when the stock they've told us about has done badly, they don't want to talk to us about it anymore. It is a stock that they still hold. So it's not a stock that they held previously. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you say that one again? Yes, yeah, sure. Sorry. I'm saying it's a stock that they still hold. So they know that they lost a lot of money or uh, earned a lot of money, or it can be, uh, can they say about stocks? Yeah, they... it's a stock. It's not a stock that they've got rid of in the past. It's a stock that they're still holding. Yeah. Um, so what is the regression here? So the dependent variable is whether or not they come and do stage two, of which um, the constant here is about, what's that, about 26% of people come and do stage two. If their stock that they told us about has done well and we told them it did well, they're more likely to come and do the second bit of our survey. So that's a 5% increase on a sort of 26% baseline. Um, and the second column is the same thing again, but with some demographic controls about the people. And we can also see the same effect on not just the absolute gains of the stock, but if we use the gains relative to the FTSE and have a dummy for whether that's positive or negative. So in other words, did the individual stock you held outperform the FTSE 100? Um, we see the same effect. Now that's interesting because um, we think the performance of the stock that they held and whether it outperformed the FTSE 100 or not is effectively as good as random. So I guess we're claiming a causal effect here because although we didn't randomize people into whether the, the biggest holding had gained or lost value, uh, the stock market, at least over the short term, effectively did randomize them into whether their stock had gained or lost in value. So I guess we're claiming a bit of causality here because we think that that uh, assignment of people to have a stock that's gained or lost or value is as good as random. We did two other experiments, which were uh, variants of, of that study. So um, in experiment two, we varied the incentive to come and do the second part of the survey, uh, uh, doubling the incentive to come and take part. And we replicated the results. And um, what did we find? Doubling the incentive has a smaller effect on people being willing to come and do the second part of the survey than being in loss. So people are prepared to forego a more than doubling of the incentive to avoid confronting information about their loss that they already know about. And we also did a, a third study switching sample to use US investors. Um, I think they were Carnegie Mellon alumni, Edeka, is that right? Uh, I don't know if there's a, a, a chat, but you can... Um, no, these were from Prolific. We had these a... are from Prolific, but from the US. Yeah, we had a pilot team. with him, you alumna, but no, this one is from Prolific. Thanks, Helica. Um, So here, we had a second treatment where the information that we originally told people when we were inviting them to come and do Survey 2, we held that information back and put it into survey two and told them that it was in there. So that if people in that treatment came to do survey two, they were coming and they knew they were gonna learn new information that they didn't, or, or potentially new information that they didn't already know. Um, so we replicated our original results, but what we also found in that was that um, compared to that people being willing to come back to learn new information, um, by comparing the effect sizes, we worked out that Roughly, the reluctance of people to come and do survey two when their biggest holding is in loss is mostly driven by this attention utility effect. They don't want to confront bad information again that they already know, um, rather than a desire to seek or avoid new information. So I shall conclude, and then I think we will we'll, we'll hand back to you, Yefin. But we've been looking at introducing the concept of attention utility and. and Principally, we're introducing an evidence base that supports this idea that hedonic pleasure is derived purely from looking at information. And Edeka had this, this nice quote, uh, which she found, 
I know this is the time to be buying stocks based on rules I've developed over decades of investing. But in order to do that, I have to log on to my brokerage account. And when I do, the first number I'll see is the current market value of my portfolio. I haven't looked in days. I don't want to look now. And so there it's the idea, I guess, that James B. Stewart, no, no relation, knows it's going to be bad news. And he simply doesn't want to be forced to look at the bad news. So I guess that's the that's the downside of, it, of the attention utility. But the idea is that there is some value in just re-experiencing already known information. And we think in this stock market hypothesis, uh, sorry, uh, stock market scenario, we've got a reasonably clean exploration where we've been able to look at that. So I shall say thank you very much for your attention. And uh, the FM, I'll hand back to you for, for questions, perhaps. Thank you so much. Although Peter will not allow me, but excellent presentation. Even I was able to understand it. So it was great. Why is Peter against excellent presentations or is he just against being nice? He's not against being nice. He's lovely. No, the chairman can do it, but uh, well, we, <laughs> I'll discuss all the time. Take too much time now. Thank you. So now is the time for questions. Well, so I, do have a, I do have a question that oh. is, uh, yeah. So people uh, enjoy listening to music or watching paintings they already know. It is quite hard at least for me to specify what real utility they get from it, but evolutionary and so on. But so I'm quite convinced there is. Uh, but I wonder to what extent is the attention utility that you study the same or different as the utility that people get from listening to music? I guess that slightly goes to the issue of whether utility might be a unidimensional construct or are there, would utility be a multidimensional construct? Perhaps it's even incommensurable that in my life, I can't just get enough utility from looking at a large pile of money that I've accumulated. I also have to have utility from being around friends and family and utility from enjoying art and utility from being in nature and so on. Does that, so I guess, is it, I, it probably isn't the same type of utility, is it? It would be, it, and I'm not sure those things are commensurable. In so the, where, where are they the same, where are they different? With the others. Sorry, Peter. Where are they? So if it's unidimensional or multidimensional, we can discuss, but in either case, where are they the same, where are they different? So good. Is it, I, I, do you have an angle? I, I don't have a, an immediate reaction to that, but do you have an angle that you've got in mind on that? No, I should think about it. But <laughs> Yeah, it seems... I think what we've done here is to present evidence that at least there does seem to be some utility of some kind from savouring good news and avoiding bad news about your stockbroking account can't really say from the evidence that we've presented whether that's the same type of utility or the same type of thing as uh, as as those examples you gave. Um, and I guess that opens up a broader debate. Some of my colleagues, Gordon Brown and Lucas Volosak, uh, also at Warwick, have been doing work on the incommensurability of different kinds of value and how one might make trade-offs between money and music and uh, cheese is always a cheese example with Gordon. Um, and maybe that's more relevant to that, that question of whether it's the same type of utility or not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, may I say something? No. No. Sorry, Erica, yeah. you're going to come in. Yeah, so I think what we show here is that people like to think or pay attention to things that reveal positive aspects of themselves, like holding up a positive portfolio, making gains. The thing with music is slightly different. I think not everyone will have the same taste for music, but in the case of experiencing gains, I think most of us will enjoy seeing gains, right? That's true. There's at least fewer individual differences in the liking for money, perhaps, than there are. Everyone agrees more money is good. Other things, other things taken into account, I guess, yeah. So I've lost track, Yafim, of who is next. Yeah, sure. That will be next, I think. Hello? 
Okay, it's me. Okay, I have a, a long shot uh, hypothesis because I also exhibit this uh, behavior, uh, which is, you know, it's really nice that you have a paper that, uh, that if people in the audience exhibit this behavior and they're aware of the fact that they exhibit it, so I'm one of those. I wonder I whether that I... makes the work trivial or extremely interesting, Ida. I'm not sure. No, it's it's not trivial. It's a, oh here is but here's my hypothesis, which is really not trivial, and this is my justification for this behavior. I wonder if this uh, holds. I hypothesize that maybe this actually makes me feel better. So when I, you know, when my sport team uh, wins, I know they already won, and I read the article again uh, uh, in the news. I feel better. So I wonder if people that exhibit more this behavior are happier, happier people. They find a way to uh, moderate their happiness, um, which can be different in music. You know, um, uh, definitely watching the same movie again, I don't think make people happier in the long run. Uh, this might, uh, so I, this is a really long shot, but, but if you can do that, but this could be worth checking. Because this may be an easy way to make people happier, to some degree, if yeah, unless everybody exhibits it to the same. It seems a, a bit like those sort of cognitive behavioral therapy interventions, where one makes a list of ten things to be grateful for every morning, or maybe just one thing to be grateful for every morning if life's not going so well. But just because that refocuses your information, and you're making the list, so you already know the thing. Mm -hmm. In the moment, you're you're focusing your attention on that thing. Um, yeah. as an intervention to try and make you better, I guess. So I think, yeah, pro you could well be onto something. As to whether people who, I can't remember who asked it, but someone was suggesting that maybe you're re-logging in to check that the money's still there or somehow to confirm that what you saw wasn't too good to be true. Maybe it's a way of moderating feelings of anxiety as well. And it's, uh, people are, the people who are logging in repeatedly aren't generally happier, but they are doing it to manage an anxiety that they would otherwise struggle with. Um, uh, you could add yeah, that um, it's not in the paper, but I have looked at the data and on rainy days, so or like when we have poor weather, these people tend to look at their portfolio even more often if they hold gains. So it seems that they are trying to recover their emotional state. So we we might think that they are experiencing some form of positive well-being from this, from the observation. That was also, I think, if I remember rightly, Attica, an attempt from us to find some exogenous random variation in the amount of time one would have in the day to attend to one's portfolio. I think elsewhere we already know that people spend less time logging in and looking at their portfolio when it's sunny. Um, because just the opportunity it cost of, they could be out having a barbecue instead, right? Nice, thanks. Do you hear me well? Kinaret, you are next. Yeah. I need, so, so are Hello. you, it might be that you're suggesting that maybe we can replace the common explanation to the disposition effect instead of loss aversion. Now we have this attention utility explanation. Yeah, there's a, there's a paper that's just coming out about testing out different accounts of um explanations for the disposition effect i wish i could remember it off the top of my head um certainly that first plot that we put up it looks very much like the disposition effect plot right doesn't it where it's the on you know on the y axis instead of the probability of logging in you'd have the probability that you sell that stock exactly right so it, they look really similar um I don't know, Adika, do you want to come in on that one? Have you got, you've yes. thought about that a lot more than me. Yes, actually in the latest version of the paper, we have estimated individual coefficients for the ostrich effect and for the disposition effect, and they are correlated. So it seems that someone who is ostrich also tend to display larger disposition effects. So probably they both come from the same mechanism, right? One, in one you don't want to look at losses, in the other one you don't want to realize losses. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that th those things will turn out to be linked. I think also, so something I'm quite keen to do, which we haven't done, it, with the disposition effect, if you, so there's a couple of things I've been thinking about. So one is, 
there seems to be an attentional link in that um, the size of the disposition effect goes down in proportion to the number of stocks that you hold in game, right? So it seems like the disposition effect is almost a portfolio level phenomena where I you could model it as deciding which stock, I've decided I'm gonna sell a stock that's in gain. So I show a disposition effect, but then I just choose a stock in gain at random, which means if you're looking at the probability of selling any one stock, if there's just one stock in gain, you're gonna sell that one. But if there's two stocks in gain, well, it's 50-50 as to which one you sell. And so if you break out the disposition effect by the number of stocks in gain and loss in your portfolio, you can see that the size of the disposition effect exactly follows what you'd expect from not the disposition effect being a property of an individual stock, but the disposition effect being an overall portfolio level decision as to whether you're going to sell or not. And then you just randomly choose from among your winners. So that's got the idea in it that your attention is sort of dissipated over all of the stocks that are in your candidate set for selling just in proportion to how many there are in the, you know, the attention is just shared equally across those proportions. So that's one thing. And then an another thing, which is, I guess, would be a test of the belief-based idea is that um, if, if I show the disposition effect because I see a stock that's lost in value and I don't want to sell it because I believe it's going to come good again, so that's sort of a belief-based explanation, then I ought to buy more of it. If I believe the price is going to go up, but but nobody does that. They don't buy more. They don't sell what they've got, so they show the disposition effect. But if they really believe the stock was going to come good again, they should buy loads of it, but they don't. Even if they could afford to, right? They could either, this is, you can see this even for people who've got cash on hand. So that's what you're saying, that, that goes beyond the attention, right? In this case. Yeah, well, it makes me think if it if the effect were entirely driven by beliefs about future changes in the price of the stock, you should see people buy more of it. And the effect doesn't seem to be driven by that. So that leaves open, open the attentional explanation rather than a belief-based explanation. But this is all quite early. Well, it's work I wish I'd finished already. Leo, will you go away, sweetie? Thank you. Sorry, the dog's gone crazy. Um, it's work I wish I'd done, but it's been going on for a while, but I haven't I haven't made inroads on it yet. Thanks. Thank you very much. You have to show us the dog, but I have I don't have a question, but I rather have a it's comment. To sleep now. <laughs> oh, too bad for us. Um, as for me, it was very surprising because from my experience with Prolific and Amtrak, the participants are willing to do almost everything for additional one pound or one dollar. So it was very surprising the fact that to avoid the bad information they was giving up the one pound. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the, I believe the results, and also this is among prolific participants who do uh, who are retail investors. So they'll be among the better off prolific participants who perhaps aren't there. I don't know why they're there at all, actually, but uh, they're perhaps not quite so motivated by money. I, it, I'm not sure whether we could come up with some carefully calibrated estimate of how much, what, like what's the monetary value of not being forced to pay attention to the losses you have, right? And it's just being forced to pay attention to the losses you have for like a couple of minutes. So people are wanting to extract, you know, it'll be off the order of several pounds a minute, wouldn't it, I think, Edeka, to avoid thinking about the fact that your portfolio is not doing well, which you already know. I don't, know, I don't know if you could add all of that up. I have a feeling it would. The reason I have, I'm not so convinced about it is because I'm just we'd find some monetary value. But I'm reminded of the experiments done by my colleagues um, Ivo Vlayev and uh, he and Nick Chater, where they did they would see how much money people they gave people a series of electric shocks, and then they asked them how much money will you pay to not have the next shock, right to avoid it, and you could get some sum of money out of people. If you double the size of all of the electric shocks, it doesn't make any difference to how much money people pay, at least roughly. So it suggests that this is a bit like that sort of study where you can find some sum of money that people will pay to avoid reliving bad news, but I bet they wouldn't pay twice as much to avoid reliving that bad news for twice as long, for example. I think it would all be very 
what's the um, Slovak term? It's like sort of very scale insensitive, isn't it? I, so I don't know if you could put a monetary value on it, but and to that end, I'm not sure how much I, I do believe that people don't want to see this information, but I think they're completely unable to put any kind of monetary value on how much they want to avoid it. They just don't want to do it. And that's perhaps also given away by we see this disposition effect like step where it just seems to matter whether the news is good or bad, but the slopes either side of that line, they weren't that steep, right? So um, even if you went from just a tiny gain to a massive gain, you weren't that much more keen to relive the massive gain or a tiny loss to a massive loss. You're not that much more keen to avoid the massive loss. Um, so it makes me think people are sort of quite scale insensitive and they just have a feeling about, do I want to do a nice thing or a nasty thing, but not much else. Thank you. So thanks uh, for this excellent presentation. And uh, now the formal part is over and all those who have to leave can leave and we will stay for a few more minutes if there are additional, any additional questions or comments. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Will they come back if we just rerun the talk? Would people come back? That's the question, isn't it? I hadn't thought of that. Yes, that's the question. We can run this experiment, but I'm afraid maybe there will be only a few of us. <laughs> yeah, we have to tell them, yeah. How much would we have to pay them to come back and relive that same talk? Yeah. Depends on if, in, on if they have to be with open cameras or closed ones. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to remember... It was probably Dan Ariely did that. He read some poems and then asked people how much they'd pay to hear more or how much they'd pay to avoid hearing another one. And they were both positive amounts. Maybe <laughs> I'm not sure what I feel about that result now, but yeah. The same hey, people. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Hello, Leon. Hey, Neil. Hi. Um, one thought, is there a way for you to look at the opposite where when I, after I sell uh something a stock and it goes down i kind of goes back to look i go back to look at it is that is there a, a room in the data to for effect of that sort did we do that Etika? we have done that yeah we did um, it was supported by a reviewer the thing is that it's very hard to develop a prediction there because you might regret that you have sold it or if you don't sell all of the stock, mm -hmm. and the issue is, is do you regret the loss you made on the bit that you sold because it went up in price? Yeah. Or if it, are or, you, or are you happy about the gain you made on the bit that you've still kept because it went up in price? And then you can flip that round if it goes down in price. So it's, when we worked it through, it wasn't obvious what the prediction was. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, although we've, I think we did the test and it's in the cover letter, isn't it? But I don't think it made it into the manuscript. It is on the appendix. We haven't included it in the manuscript. But yeah, because the predictions were not clear, we prefer to focus on purchase mm -hmm. and sales. Right. And, and I do think it is about attention to the self as opposed to like you, you, you wouldn't just log in to see the stock price rises, right? Of someone else's or. You just kind of it's it's something about the self, I think. Yeah, elsewhere, and it reminds me of another paper that Edica and I have been working on with George and John, where we see that we're looking at the disposition effects, which you see typically against the price that you that like the purchase point, the, the price at the point of purchase. But you also see a disposition effect against if the stock's gone up in value and then dropped down a bit. So you can start here. The stock can go up in value loads. And then as soon as it drops a wee bit, you see a disposition effect and people don't want to sell it. Even though you're up, you know, hugely on where you started, you're down a little bit on the peak and show you sell a disposition effect. But if that peak in the price had happened, oh, you can't see it because it's off camera. Uh, if that peak in the price happens before you bought the stock, you don't use it as a reference point. It's only peaks since you bought the stock that seem to show this, we're calling it a peak price effect, um, where the peak takes over as a reference point from the original purchase price. So that again is something about, is it only because you were only paying attention to the stock, the price of the stock, and so you didn't really know it had peaked before? That could be true, or it could be that, 
you know, the peak was just irrelevant to you. It's a, it's a, certainly a, if you think that the peak is, the peak of price, say, in the past year represents where this stock could possibly get back to. It shouldn't matter whether you owned the stock or not at the time of the peak, but it turns out it really does. So it's there is that something of the personal, your own personal experience in that, even though everybody sees the same price trajectory for a stock, it matters whether you owned it or not when the peak happened. Have I messed that explanation up, Edeka? I think that was right. Uh, no, it was right. But there is, um, so there's another way to see whether the personal feeling about the decision matters. If you, if you remember, Neil, we also look at mutual funds in, mm -hmm. in the paper. So for people who hold mutual funds, we don't find the effect of big prices and also of um, other reference points like the purchase price or the price the last time they log in. So it seems that I guess they can delegate the responsibility of, you know, to the mutual fund manager when the stock is not performing mm -hmm. well, fund is not performing yeah. well. Okay, thanks. Erika, very nice work. So you're a PhD student? No, I ha I graduated. Uh, I was Enjoy it, Erika. Well, people still think that you look young enough to be a PhD student. Just take that one. But I'm so sorry. I didn't <laughs> get to, uh, I, I, I can't I was, insult I you in any way. <laughs> I'm you sorry. should say where you are now, Adika, so people yeah, know. To compliment by one sentence, you're feeling very good. You're getting better. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you. I am at least, I am associate professor, at least. But I was a PhD student like four years ago, five years ago, Neil. I don't remember well. I'm assuming that you've tried to block those times from your memory, Adika. It was the, the, the trauma of us working together. Uh... Cool. Cool. Very nice. Okay, so I think on this positive note, we will end our talk for today. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, thank you yeah, very much. Thank Neil. you so much for in thank you so much for inviting me. I re really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye.